This is Digital Music Trends, episode 147, on the 28th of August 2013. This week on the show, Pandora's earnings and cap lift, the VMAs, Apple TV gets Vivo, Pledge Music and Catalog releases, PRS for Music signs a new deal with YouTube, and lots more. This week's show is sponsored by Sheridan's at sheridan's.co.uk. Welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as audio and video on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher and now with a brand new on-demand presence on TuneIn Radio instead of the 24-hour radio that we had before on there. You can get in touch with the show by tweeting on at DigiMusicTrends or email on contact at DigitalMusicTrends.com and it's time to introduce this week guests, uh, starting with uh, Karim Fanu's uh, head of research at Music Ally uh, on musically.com. Uh, hey Karim, everything good? Very good, Andrea. Thanks a lot for having me. It's a pleasure to be here as usual. How are you? Great. Uh, it's great to have you on and it's great to have the Music Ally banner in the background. And if people don't <laughs> oh, no. know about... If people don't know about uh, about this uh, about the the company, they should check out musically.com. It's a great resource, uh, and uh, also great to have Darren Hemmings on today, founder of digital marketing consultancy Motive Unknown uh, on motiveunknown.com. Hey, Darren, how's it going? Hello, very good, thank you. Great, great to have you on. And we're going to talk about some events at the end of the show. Uh, I know we were just mentioning in the prep, uh, working uh, hard working class heroes and. Uh, uh, Karim is going to a, an awesome event in Bogota, so I want to hear all about it and what he's going to do there. Uh, but we start off this week by talking about Pandora's, uh, Pandora's Q2 earnings, actually. So uh, the earnings are in and, uh, you know, they're kind of a mixed bag, really. Uh, the revenues were up 55% year on year over Q2 of 2012, uh, up to $157.4 million, uh, million dollars, of course. Uh, but the net losses widened, so they came up to 43 point, uh, they widened by 43.8%, uh, up to $7.8 million. So the company is having kind of a hard time closing that gap, uh, which doesn't seem like great news for investors if... Uh, uh, revenues uh, are increasing, but losses are also increasing almost proportionally to the to the revenue increase. That's that's not good news because it doesn't feel like they're gonna close that gap anytime soon. Uh, still, the company pointed out a couple of uh, positive factors uh, like uh, the decrease uh, in the royalty payments as percentage of revenues, uh, which went down 12 percent to 52 percent, uh, and uh, to the growth in mobile advertising, which was up 92 percent. So that's that's an amazing figure for them. Uh, the market wasn't too impressed though. The stock uh, kind of dropped. Uh, quite significantly, a few percentage points, going from an all-time high of twenty point thirty-four dollars uh, to just uh, above eighteen dollars uh, right now. So, first up, let's talk earnings, and then we'll talk about the, the mobile caps that were lifted. Uh, so, if losses grow at the same time as revenues, as I mentioned uh, earlier, what does that tell you about the business? And uh, are the positive signs encouraging enough to, for, for you to feel still positive about the, the business model of Pandora, Darren? No, I, I think from where I sit at the moment, it, the issue is really whether they can convince their investors who are a very different um, breed, I suppose, really. You know, yeah. the, the likes of us tend normally to look at these things in the context of um, you know, the music, the service, things like that. We're obviously, the investors are just interested in, in the bottom line. And, uh, you know, I think really your point nailed it in the sense that at the moment they're not really closing the gap, you know, so they might be uh, making more money, but... You know, well, if the revenues are going up, but the losses are widening and everything with it, then you know, or well, certainly they're not narrowing. Then it's it's not an encouraging sign. And it's and not a as worry a, across the board. Yeah, know. it's not as good as uh, you know Spotify's figures. Uh, you know, the losses increased, but they increased much less than the than the increase in earnings. So that then makes it for a much better picture, I guess. Yeah, well, that's right. You know, so with Spotify, there's sort of a you know, the, the, the points will eventually meet where the losses keep dropping and the revenues keep rising such that ultimately, you know, they turn profitable and, and all is good. Whereas a Pandora, that just doesn't appear to be the case. Um, yeah. And I think it's the question in my mind really is how long will the investors put up with that? Because they've been around a while now and, you know, they're, they're certainly a little bit longer in the tooth than some services. And, you know, as long as this remains an issue, it's, uh, it's making them look like a bad investment. Yeah, and that that can't be a good thing, really. You know, at the end of the day, if if they're looking bad to the investors, then uh, you know that's that's not good. And you would imagine the clock is ticking on this to a degree. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Karima, the company is under pressure as well because of iTunes Radio coming out, and uh, uh, 
potentially uh, attached to the iTunes radio released uh, the you know Pandora announced that they would lift the 40 hour per month cap that they imposed uh, around six months ago uh, for the for the US listeners uh, whereby listeners couldn't uh, listen to more than 40 hours per week on uh, on mobile so uh, what do you make of this change do you think is purely dictated by business uh, decisions uh, uh, on Pandora's part or has iTunes radio dictated this for them I think um, as, as one of the closest competitors, as perhaps the most significant competitor, it will have certainly influenced the strategy. But I think yeah. honing in on the, uh, on the mobile revenues is the most interesting part of this story for me. I, I agree with everything uh, Darren's just said. But So mobile revenues were up 92% um, to $116 million in Q2. So if you look at opportunity, um, according to some figures I just dug out, um, the mobile ad market, in 2012, I think Google came in at approximately 2.8 billion, Facebook around 390.9 million, Twitter at 134.9 million, and Pandora, this is in 2012, 233.2 million. Yeah. So the opportunity there is huge, and they're a mobile focused product. Um, and they're kind of plowing ahead with a very interesting model. It's just, I mean, all of the revenue is it's basically ad-supported. There's a small percentage, which is um, subscription. So I think that's the most encouraging thing to look at. It's one of the reasons they could lift that cap. Yeah. Um, but also, if they've managed to in, in, in increase those revenues by 92%, you know, let's hope they'll carry on doing that. That's a massive increase, and there is a much bigger opportunity there. So I think that's the most encouraging thing out of all of this. Yeah. Um, and one of the main reasons they lifted that cap, obviously iTunes is going to be a massive competitor. And I think uh, that from what people are saying, iTunes are on slightly better deals with rights holders as well, which is going to be a problem for Pandora. Yeah. The other thing which you mentioned, which is interesting about this whole situation, is that cost, um, cost of sales as a percentage of revenues came down. And there's a very interesting article which Glenn Peoples put out, which you've referred us to, which we might discuss later, saying that, okay, losses are being made, um, revenues are being increased. One of the problems, well, one of the main differences between Pandora and iTunes radio um, as we understand it for the moment, is that Pandora is driving low, uh, is driven by local advertising, or at least they're putting yeah. their strategic uh, advertising focus on local advertising. So some of that will be re reinvesting in local ad themes as well as other sorts of rollouts. So um, you can look at that as, as, as a bit of a strength and one of the reasons why they're managing to increase these mobile revenues. But I think they need to carry on investing. Maybe that's why the losses are widening. They need to scale quickly. The interesting figure is reducing that percentage uh, cost of sales as percentage of revenues. And if it keeps going down, there's a space somewhere on a graph in the future where they imagine they can hit you know, good, good profit. But I don't yeah. know if and when that's coming. But I think those are the two key things to look at for me. Yeah, no, it makes absolute sense. And of course, from a business perspective, you know, if you have a cap on mobile and mobile is what's driving growth, uh, then you're not going to be able to sell more than 40 hours worth of advertising to, to your advertising customers. So mm -hmm. lifting that cap also allows you to increase the amount of advertising that you make. Of course, the question is whether they are losing, still losing money on the mobile streaming or whether the advertising is making up for what they have to pay in royalties at the moment. So that's, mm -hmm. that's a big question mark, I guess. Yeah, well, I think, you know, if you look at, so that's Q2, it puts them in over the year, if it, if it increases like that across all the quarters, and they've doubled their advertising uh, mobile ad income from last year. So, you know, yeah. it's just good figures to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. And, and, you know, we'll have to see how the story develops on Pandora uh, and uh, how the market will react to iTunes Radio's introduction. And, of course, Karim, you pointed out to the local, uh, localized aspects of the advertising team on, on Pandora's front. I think that's a really big strength for, for them because, uh, like we talked last week, iTunes Radio has lined up about 12 mega corporations to be their advertisers. And, and there can't be a huge amount of personalization done in those ad, ad campaigns. So... Uh, I think that's that's a minus for me on iTunes Radio. If you all get the same ads and they're all the same big corporate ads, yeah. yeah. But uh, interesting stuff. And uh, so uh, I want to talk about some mainstream news uh, now, uh, which you don't don't usually cover. But I think it's interesting to talk about the VMAs that happened this week. Uh, so uh, I'm sure you were all glued to the TV screens about three o'clock in the morning. No. <laughs> 
<laughs> to check out uh, Taylor uh, Taylor Swift and Lady Gaga and all, and all those. Uh, nice so the ceremony was uh, <laughs> the ceremony was uh, celebrating its thirtieth year on the air. Uh, although for the first time it was uh, uh, done at the new Barclays Center in Brooklyn, uh, and it did surprisingly well uh, with the viewers. Uh, so the viewers were up 66 percent over last year uh, to an average of ten point one million. And of course the presence of uh, almost every single pop uh, star. Uh, in the US that has a release out right now uh, was a big help, including uh, Gaga, Katy Perry, as well as, as, uh, as Justin Timberlake with a reunion with NSYNC uh, and a uh, controversial Miley Cyrus performance. Uh, so these all came together to, to make a pretty strong uh, um, turnout uh, audience-wise anyway. And uh, of course, in terms of winners, that's a, sort of a minor point to talking about uh, video of the year, Justin Timberlake. Uh, Best hip hop video, Macklemore, Ryan Lewis, of course. Best male video, Bruno Mars, Locked Out of Heaven. Best female video, Taylor Swift, I Knew You Were Trouble. Uh, I think the best rock video went to 30 Seconds to Mars. Uh, but yeah, you know, the winners are, are the winners, and, and it's not that, that interesting. But I think what's interesting is talking about the relevance of award ceremonies, which is uh, always tied to ratings, especially in the US. Uh, and we've seen big spikes for the Grammys, and we've also sp seen a big spike for the VMAs this year. So. Is the public getting back into the groove uh, of uh, getting excited about award ceremonies? And what could be the driver of that? Because, of course, you know, appointment viewing, in theory, is, is on, on, the, on the down, especially in the States. Uh, Karim, what's your take on that? Oof, well, I think this one, they've, they've really turned around um, their performance from last year. And I think it's just, it's all about programming and hype, isn't it? So I think yeah. it's all of the things that you just said. They had a great lineup. They had a much better slot in terms of, I think it was Sunday evening, wasn't it? Um, as opposed to a Thursday the year before. Um, so uh, I think they just managed to hype it and get a good lineup. And that still does attract people. I think there's a lot to be yeah. said for curation and programming and big glitzy events. And I think <laughs> there was a lot of Twitter activity around it as well, yeah. which was a good thing and probably help spread spread awareness as well yeah yeah sure and and darren uh, did, did you know I, I was talking about i was kind of skipping through the winners uh are winners important at this point or is it just about the show and and nobody really cares about who wins the award i don't know i mean i suppose it depends what you measure the um the value of the win on i mean <laughs> you know it's like from an industry side if the win means you sell more records and everything then yeah i suppose uh, the, the win is important yeah. to someone um uh, but equally i think these events are just uh, you know i mean you know cream sort of got it right in that sense that it's you know it's an event that's what people want is a big one-off event and people like big one-off events whether it's you know the mtv awards or sports personality of the year in the uk or you know any of these things that are just kind of single single one-off big things that you want to be there for and they've been pretty smart with this i mean let's not forget you know that whole um colbert report kind of moment with uh, Daft Punk supposedly being booked for the VMAs and uh, being pulled from his show and all of that is, you know, clearly is just one big hype. You know, they turned yeah. his show into one big shill for the, for the awards and did a very good job because the way in which it was done went very viral and, yeah. you know, all of that stuff just helps drive up the cultural value attached to this stuff. And yeah. equally, you know, he's built, don't they? I mean, whether it's that, you know, train crash of the Miley Cyrus bit this year, you know, the point is that, sadly, now everyone will tune in next year to see what is possibly going to top that, yeah. you know, because there's going to be something, and it won't necessarily be planned, it's, you know, it, it, but it'll be something, and so, um, yeah, people will tune in knowing that it's an event, and everyone likes an event at the end of the day, I don't think everyone's lost their passion for events in the same way as you know, I, I think the passion for music is every bit as strong as it was 20 years ago. It's just perhaps not reflected in the way people spend their money. Yeah. It doesn't mean that they don't like music less now. And uh, the same could be said here, but I don't know. I, you know, it's, it's tricky not to look at all of that stuff and just put my head in my hands, really, because there's a, there's a tipping point where the spectacle has overtaken the, you know, the depth and the art form around this stuff. And I, that, I find yeah. that really rather sad. That's a really big point for me, actually. I've got a question for you guys, but first, just following up on what you've just said, Darren, the, the Miley Cyrus thing, I thought, you know, whatever, it was sensational, it caused a big buzz, whatever, but what upset me is that the song underneath it, you know, Robin Thicke didn't seem to sing that well, whether that was due to monitoring or he was just a bit put off by the whole situation, and that's sad because the song suffered, right? And that's what these things used to be about. Obviously, this is more about performance and video, but that, that's kind of what upset me a little bit, so the integrity of the art was compromised 
victimized and what won was the spectacle. But then my question to you guys, I'm interested to know, it's slightly contentious, but you think Miley Cyrus was a winner in any way in terms of publicity and awareness? Because that's all I've heard. You know, VMAs, Miley Cyrus, really. Oh, yeah. you know, most of the noise has been around that. She's broken a Vivo record, hasn't she, with her new video as well? So, as a, what subsequently off the back of the awareness? Uh, I'm not sure if it was off the back of it or if it was. Uh, I just read a headline uh, earlier this morning, uh, but I'm sure the the performance won't have hurt Vivo views. So, I don't know. It's one of those things that like look at where Robin Thicke is and uh, right now with the uh, blurred lines and how successful it was of course it was a it was a better a better song than Miley Cyrus's but uh some good old controversies drive sales doesn't it Darren uh yeah I mean it, it makes me <laughs> makes me weep for the days when pop music could actually achieve a double whammy of being you know great music and be subversive and carry depth I mean whether it's the KLF or whatever went since Madonna at her best, you know, all these people at times had a capability to, to, you know, do something that carried depth. And I think it's very true that certain people have pointed out there really was no depth at all to what Miley Cyrus did. It was just, you know, edginess for, well, it's not even edgy these days, is it? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, but just doing it for the sake of doing it. And I, and I, I, you know, I feel old saying it, but I feel a bit sad that that's the case. You know, I, I I do think that at some point this has just become that shallow, whether it's kind of Rihanna and, you know, how sort of hyper-sexualized she's become and, you know, just a lot of it is, you know, there's a lot of mixed messages getting rolled up there into one big happy pop product, whether it's yeah. the kind of pseudo-rapey element of Blurred Lines or Miley Cyrus kind of, you know, taking it just, you know, well over the line in terms of a performance or anything. It's just all a bit... <laughs> Like, I, you know, I have no problem at all with, with people being subversive or people challenging the status quo or anything like that. I love all that kind of thing. I think that's great. But the kind of dumb, pawned out way in which this stuff is done is just fucking sad. Yeah. I, I just had a thought, actually. I would love to see somebody uh, take the time. I mean, I don't have the time to do it, but somebody, somebody would be great if they did it. Uh, it was uh, make a graph of the impact on sales of uh, winners versus performers at the Grammys versus the VMAs. To, mm. to understand the lift in sales produced by the performance at a certain ceremony versus winning at a certain ceremony. And yeah, whether there's it, a difference between the two. Because I, I feel like the Grammys are more of an, of an endorsement by Recording, Recording Academy and people feel, feel it's more like a recommendation. So that maybe that's why the sales go up so much after somebody wins a Grammy. But I don't know if that's the same for the VMAs. Or, yeah, I mean, I, I, it feels like they're very different areas. But, you know, yeah. the, the VMAs is about culture. And it feels like music is, is, you know, is blended with culture there. And it's a, it's a massively mixed medium now in that sense that it's, you know, I mean, I, I sort of always say this around the, you know, the bands I work with where it's, it's, it's about sort of cultural cut through, you know, you're trying to stake your place in the current popular culture and, and, you know, what's going on within that. And sometimes you have a lightning strike where it all just lines up and, and, you know, big things happen like, in my case, Alt J, but then, you know, with others, you might get something where you've got an amazing record and it's generally agreed to be an amazing record, but for whatever reason, it just doesn't connect. And, yeah. and the, it's the cultural thing that is the, is the point of difference there. You know, if it's, it could be the greatest record ever made, but if it's not lined up and, and positioned at the right time in the right manner, you know, within the cultural conversation, then it doesn't work. It's the same reason, you know, Candle in the Wind is the biggest selling single ever or whatever, because of it just was a part of that cultural moment where everyone just had to swell to, to react to that kind of thing. It fed it. And I think with these sorts of things, you know, the winners of the VMAs are the Miley Cyruses and everything because by doing that and by being so outrageous, they cut straight through popular culture to become the water cooler moment of the award, you know, that everyone stands around in the office next day going, oh, my God, did you see that? And I think in her case, it's kind of like, you know, these things burn bright, but burn bloody short, you know, and, it, and it's, it's great until someone else comes along that just goes even further down that line or, but who knows? I mean, it may yet change and we may get someone come along who's, you know, I mean, I think Gargo, when she was good, could be a little more subversive and she's not kind of plastic Barbie doll yeah. type. She's pretty mad, but at times she tends to these days border onto something more akin to a Chris Morris sketch. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sort of, much as I don't like her in many respects, I'm sort of glad that she's there because without her, you'd just be left with kind of sapless morons like Rihanna and, and Miley. So, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. 
It's pretty, pretty true. But, but on that note, you know, you can expect a gyrating episode of Digital Music Trends to hit your airwaves soon. Working <laughs> <laughs> <Looking> away. <laughs> I got a poll right here. And since uh, and, uh, and Dharma, we're going to go back to a story that we talked about a few weeks ago when, when we did the, the mega panel show with about eight people on, uh, when, uh, when the whole Nigel Godrick Spotify controversy started. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you've been... Uh, uh, living under a rock or on holiday for about six weeks uh, uh, there was a big controversy with uh, uh, Radiohead's producer uh, Nigel Godric uh, speaking out against uh, streaming and Spotify in particular uh, talking about how it's not a sustainable model for young artists uh, and now The Guardian published uh, uh, you know Harry Gibson of The Guardian uh, published a, a follow-up interview with him uh, in regards to his thoughts about streaming and of course you know th there's not a huge amount to add actually you know from the article it's, 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 there's not a lot of information coming out of that but uh, I think you know the, the main the key points to take away from that are that he understands that streaming is a future but he's not satisfied by the gatekeepers who have set out a model that is far from optimal for artists and he also takes a stab uh, at uh, a piece that was published uh, it was actually by Eamon uh, where he he talks about uh, uh, that, how it's impossible for artists to get a 400k uh, from from four hundred thousand uh, dollars or pounds from an endorsement deal. Although to be fair to Amon, he he said up to four hundred k, so he didn't say that artists would normally get that amount. Uh, so what do you make of the piece and the the, the need for uh, him to clarify his position after so much ink has been uh, spilled over the issue? Uh, Darren, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, uh, I, th I think in hindsight, because obviously uh, you know I do the the Daily Digest and I had a. a it wasn't so much of a comment as a rant, really, that sort of went out that night having read the article. Um, and, you know, which I stand by. I don't regret what I wrote at all. Uh, but, you know, really, what I didn't realise at the time, certainly what became evident afterwards, was that uh, clearly Nigel wasn't particularly pleased with that article either. He thought he was talking about the new Ultra Mr remix album and and it kind of got warped into, you know, Godrich speaks on Spotify and everything else. Now, so... I'll give him that, that, uh, you know, he clearly had been a little naive, uh, I think, really, about the, what was going to happen there. Yeah. Um, but he was asked about it, obviously, because he talked about it. So the, the topic must have come up. And I just felt like, really, um, you know, he offered nothing by way of, of you know, anything useful on, on the subject, yeah. really, is the sort of nub of it. Um, he was just kind of... And I think what, what's, what annoys me quite a lot about his stance on this, like he's entirely welcome. And I think it's been quite good that he is critical because I think sometimes, you know, being critical um, promotes discussion and that's no bad thing. You know, we, sometimes that makes us all reflect a bit more. I'm all for that. You know, that's, that's good. That's healthy. Um, what has annoyed me a little bit about Nigel's position on this is that he's kind of critical but without really offering any kind of constructive response. He's just saying, you know, they don't pay enough, it's not good enough, it's all shit, don't, don't use Spotify and things like that. And it's kind of like, mate, you are now becoming a quintessential Brit. You are the man just standing on the corner, moaning a lot and doing nothing, you know, yeah. talking loud, saying nothing. So, and, and you can't just sort of divest your responsibilities and go, well, it's not my problem to, uh, to, to come up with a solution. I mean, in a, in, in a pure sense, no, it isn't his problem. But if you're going to start the fight, you should at least try and balance it with a, a more positive uh, response, you know. And I, yeah. I just, I wish at this point we could try and move this to being a, a more positive discussion around what could be done. We know, we know he doesn't like it, and we know that maybe artists don't see as much. But, it, you know, I just, I, I, I get so tired with people criticizing, but without offering a constructive response to it and yeah. it's a bit i'm not saying that he shouldn't have spoken about it he is welcome to have his opinion but i find it quite sad that at this point he's done absolutely nothing to find or offer a response which is not to say that he himself has to provide one yeah. but it would be quite nice if perhaps nigel i don't know you know offered a, a piece from someone else that he thought supported a, a more constructive argument i don't know not but sure. at the minute he just feels like he's standing on the sidelines being like the Waldorf and Statler of the streaming thing along with Tom York. And it's just, yeah. I'm bored of it. You know, yeah. we need a positive discussion now. So it's kind yeah. of sad he hasn't done that.
And Karim, uh, for you, is it was it like a, a? I mean, I felt like it was a slightly pointless follow-up interview, just because his only you know clarification is the fact that he's not against streaming altogether. He's just against the way that it has been set up by big business. Uh, but what are your thoughts on that? On that? Well, I think first of all, before I say anything, Nigel uh, Godrich is a legendary producer. Now, following that, right? Uh, as we all think, all three of us think that. But what Darren's just said is is uh, really interesting for me, uh, and what you've just said as well backs it up. When I re- read it again yesterday, I thought, "Is this just a promotional piece for Ultra Easter?" You know, the, the way it was announced at the bottom, and there was no substance in that piece whatsoever. I was really yeah. disappointed by it. So it's interesting that he maybe thought that you know that the reason for the interview was different. My whole um, position on this debate is. Yes, they are being too negative. I'm very positive about these things. And let's not forget we're in a marketplace in transition. Um, you know, we're talking about cost of sales as a percentage of revenue and how these services are trying to build themselves. Down the road, we've got a whole new bunch of consumer propositions coming when people experiment with mid-tier services um, and lower price points. We're now also, as opposed to maybe when OK Computer, I can't remember the year, what was the year of release on that? I can't remember. pre Napster. Um, well, that's it. That's the important <laughs> bit. So we're now at a point where the consumers are ruling the marketplace, right, and dictating its shape in yeah. a sense. Whereas when he was, or when OK Computer came out, 97. it was completely the opposite. Um, and consumers, you could argue, were being uh, abused a little bit um, with price points and, and substance on records. So they have to be more positive about this. And you know, things like Tony Kewell's uh, piece on on um, seas of pennies come to light. You know, you've got to just try and look at all of your revenue um, from different streams and maximize it um, and look to the future and support new models. Um, You know, if Spotify goes away, this argument is interesting because they're all talking about Spotify, but what about YouTube? They're not attacking YouTube. You know, YouTube is the biggest, arguably the biggest music streaming service out there, and it's a good thing. And they're yeah. not bringing YouTube into the same discussion, yeah. um, which I think is, is a fault as well if they're going to take that stance. Um, and I did have one more thing to say on this, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> no, but it, it makes total sense to pick up on YouTube as well, because uh, uh, the next story was actually the PRS for Music uh, uh, reaching, uh, you know, the Collection Society in the UK, reaching a new licensing deal with YouTube that covers the video platform across official videos, uh, live footage, and user-generated vis- videos for use of music written by over 100,000 songwriters, composers, and publishers represented by the society. So the new agreement includes, uh, it also includes the rights to independent repertoire via the independent music publishers European licensing which is Impel initiative uh, and uh, that can count on the likes on the works of uh, the likes of David Bowie with Bucks Music and Justin Timberlake through Imogen uh, amongst others and so this is kind of a similar deal to what uh, it feels like a similar agreement to the one reached by YouTube with Sassim uh, three months ago uh, and it's internationally very relevant because it covers 130 uh, uh, territories worldwide uh, of course the uh, chief executive of PRS for Music was uh, very pleased uh, um, with the agreement uh, and uh, uh, YouTube as well and uh, uh, as we've been j- just been talking about Spotify you know YouTube of course pays much less per stream but it has a much bigger audience uh, uh, and it's not getting getting anywhere near the same amount of pressure uh, on paying artists more so what do these deals with the PRS and SASA mean for YouTube and can we safely say that it has won the societies over with with uh, its current model uh, bar gamma of course because that, that's never going to happen uh, but uh, you know can we safely say the societies are happy with the rates they're getting and uh, why isn't there you know more pressure from the industry to try and get a bit more money from youtube anybody want to take that one I've, well, I'll, I'll jump in. I've got, I've not got a huge amount of comment on this, except for it's a good thing to have reached such a big deal. But I'm not entirely sure the societies are happy. I mean, I know yeah. some societies um, have been, you know, have felt kind of forced into into compromise positions uh, yeah. in making deals. So I would say this isn't, you know, the ideal deal necessarily. Although I don't know the terms, but I'd say it's a working compromise because you either go with YouTube or you don't. And if you don't go with YouTube you suffer to a certain extent. Yeah. So I, I don't think it's that rosy under the surface, but I think it's a very important deal that needs to be made. Yeah, absolutely. Aaron, anything to add on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting deal, but, you know, there's a lot of rumor about YouTube launching a, you know, a streaming music service of their own so that Google, yeah. somewhat bizarrely, will have two on the go in the sense of the all-access one and, and then YouTube itself. And I'm a little curious and slightly worried as to how this may relate 
to that, yeah. whether there's a deal done in the context of you know the service perceived as one thing and then ultimately developing into something else. You know what I mean? And it's uh, I'm just a, a little curious about that. I mean, I I think YouTube is a funny one. It's it's absence from this Godrich streaming services debate is pretty huge. You know, it's it's sort of it's like a very glaring omission. Um, and, you know, I think certainly publishing is the area that people are talking about least in that yeah. respect. And, you know, with regards to all streaming services too, whether it's Pandora, Spotify or beyond. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's good that the, you know, agreements have been reached. And, I, you know, I, I don't think the Gemma kind of holdout stance and things like that works for anybody. Um, yeah, that's right. But there is a sort of give and take element to this, and you know, and as Kareem said, it's sort of if the, the if people are sort of grudgingly sign these things and then empires are built upon them, then that's not a, that's not a you know a huge victory to celebrate necessarily. Yeah. So it's a sort of you know a cautious welcome, I suppose, would be the best way of describing it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I was actually really taken aback when I was talking to societies uh, uh, back in Washington uh, as to how small the percentage of revenues that comes from. Uh, mm. from digital and in particular streaming services is uh, right now uh, yeah. and so um, I'm curious to see whether in the next 12 months or so whether that percentage is going to increase and by how much and uh, I'm going to take a short break right now so uh, in the second half of the show we talk, we're talking about Nine Inch Nails uh, Vivo on the Apple TV uh, Pledge Music finding new releases and more but first we'll take a short break uh, featuring this week's sponsor of uh, Digital Music Trends Media Law from Sheridan's <laughs> I'm here with uh, Tahir Bashir uh, this week from uh, Sheridan's and we're going to talk about uh, artists and contracts. And so contracts are central to an artist's career, whether it's a management deal, a, a label deal or anything like that. And how do you help them navigate through these agreements and help them understand them? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of contracts are quite complicated and, and uh, whilst uh, artists nowadays are more commercially savvy than they have ever been, uh, you know, you're still talking about legal agreements and how they fit together. So if you've got an artist now who's uh, a musician but also has other interests, yeah. uh, so maybe fashion, maybe TV, maybe film, maybe endorsements, you've got to make sure that your contracts all fit in together. It's like a matrix of arrangements. So the first things first is making sure that artists understand what they're entering into. So having the skill to be able to explain things in layman's terms and simple terms and give a bit of guidance around those. Yeah, sure. And artists can be quite intimidated by, you know, the amount of clauses and, and decisions they have to make around the deal. And so uh, they might have a lot of questions. And uh, so how approachable are lawyers? And I know that artists can be quite intimidated by having to deal with, uh, uh, with a law firm and having to call an office and everything like that. Is, are you quite approachable in that sense? I hope so. We're human beings. We're not. We're not uh, demons. Um, I mean, other uh, other lawyers may uh, you know shy away from uh, you know being a bit less formal. But you know, in this industry, we're surrounded by creatives. All, all of our clients are creatives. So ultimately, you have to be approachable. So you know, we don't wear necessarily wear suits and just generally try and talk in you know relaxed, um, engaging terms. Um, so it's important that uh, you know artists feel comfortable with you because you know it's that old adage: no question question is a silly question. You want the, art, you know, the artist to be able to ask you questions yeah. and you need to be able to explain it to them in, in, in simple terms. Yeah, sure. And is it quite tough to uh, stand between uh, artist managers or labels when you are negotiating a deal? Is there a lot of uh, toing and froing, uh, trying to get the best deal you can for your artist? There can be, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the idea is to try and simplify and shrink all of those negotiations as much as you can. Because obviously the longer it runs, the more momentum you lose from a deal, the more expensive it gets. Yeah. So the idea is to try and shrink it all together. And, you know, once you've got, uh, when you've got enough experience, you can deal with things over the phone, you can have meetings, it doesn't always have to be email toing and froing. Sure. Uh, and also uh, a good experienced music lawyer should be able to help an artist make decisions and not just effectively be there to wait for the artist to tell them what to do. So, you know, you should be able to guide them and say, well, you know, I think you should be doing this based on what I've seen. This is reasonable. This is not reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Awesome. Thank you. And until next week.
And we're back, and we're gonna talk about Nine Inch Nails. Uh, so uh, Nine Inch Nails broke new ground with uh, direct-to-fan models uh, with a number of releases in the last uh, few years. Uh, but their new album, Hesitation Marks, will be released via Columbia Records. Uh, Trent Reznor talked a few months back about why that was, and about uh, his need to have a big team around him that uh, probably knew things, you know, how to distribute a record better than him uh, internationally, and, and finding that the Columbia team was a good, hungry team. It was quite compact, and it wasn't uh, over uh, sort of sprawling, and, and he he felt comfortable going with Columbia for the release. Uh, Nine Inch Nails also went a very traditional platform for the pre-stream of the album, so they went with iTunes. Uh, the album went on streaming yesterday, actually in its entirety, so a very traditional route uh, for this Nine Inch Nails release. So what do we take away from this? You know, for years we were talking about how popular acts may decide to forego majors completely and self-release, and this is just the latest example of how that fear was probably unfounded uh, and the fact that you know that the fear that majors are doomed and and you know it's just the fact of their role changing slightly and, and them adopting slightly different uh, uh, you know capacities and actually uh, big artists that went away up might actually be going back to 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 major labels uh, uh, in the, in the next uh, few months and years so i don't know uh, what's 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 uh, the word on that uh, darren do, do you feel like that's going to be the case that you know artists uh, that went away from majors are going to realize that uh, actually there is a huge benefit in having their marketing cloud uh, marketing cloud behind them and if they have restructured and they are leaner organizations then it might make sense to just stick with them um yeah i mean i think a, a big part of this comes down to aspects of sort of budget spend and what they feel these people can do yeah. and what they're expecting to get back i mean it's quite funny in the context of all the discussions around what artists make around albums because you know frequently the 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 cold reality is that they don't make much, if anything, from album sales, and the bulk of the revenue comes from all the things that spin off from that. Yeah. And if you take that as your starting point, then I would imagine there's probably quite a compelling reason to go back to a major label if they feel that you know they're going to take that burden away from them by way of the spend and the budgets re required up front. You know, it's uh, it's sort of liability free because the liability of the spend and you know the money committed is no longer Trent Reznor's; it's uh, it's Sony's. You know, but yeah. equally, I think you know the, the the desire on his part is probably that he just wants that big old you know big splash where Sony go in very bold. You know, they spend a lot of money on this stuff. You know, I mean, Columbia is sponsoring a Formula One racing team at the moment for Christ's sake. You know, they're they're not mucking about. There's no indie would do that. So, you know, in that sense, I think it's interesting, but equally telling that when they're doing things like the iTunes streams and things like that, for me, like as a, as, you know, as a, as, a, as a guy working in music marketing, I suppose, you know, I look at that and just conclude that this is about, you know, big sales, big results, you yeah. know, big everything that puts Nine Inch Nails back where they want to be as a sort of state stadium level group, you know. Yeah. Um, and drives that thing in the same way as, you know, I think with Daft Punk, the, the same end was achieved. You know, they made it a big event. They spend boldly. You know, we're not talking Google banner ads. We're talking Formula One stickers on the cars and everything. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very different level. I mean, the, the bit I would, I would love to be able to be a party to, but of course we never will be, is the, is the kind of profit and loss balance sheet for these things and, you know, and whether things like Nine Inch Nails are taken on by Columbia, not so much because they feel they're going to turn around a load of money on it, but because they know that by having Nine Inch Nails on Columbia, there's a brand maintenance exercise here that makes yeah. Columbia an artist's label that people want to sign to. And then they might recoup because other people will then go and sign to Columbia who are maybe younger, you know, cooler bands who want to be on that label, you know. So, um, yeah, I think it's 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 really just about, you know, repositioning Nine Inch Nails, going for the big spend, the big show. And, you know, Trent Reznor's not a stupid man, so I, I suspect there's probably like a one-album deal or something where yeah. he's then allowing them to run it. They've got to show what they can do, so they have to overperform. Then he has the option of taking the next one somewhere else or whatever. So yeah. it's, it seems like a kind of a win-win for all involved, if I'm totally honest. You know, yeah. and Columbia have got smart people there. You know, they're, they're a savvy bunch, so they will do a good job on it, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, Karim, that, that, you know, do you agree with the big muscle, big money uh, argument? Yes, I do indeed. I mean, I, I, there, you know, there was a time um, a few years ago when everybody said kind of D2C was going to ruin the majors, the industry was changing forever, but it, it hasn't in that sense. D2C and the ability to market 
direct to fans and sell direct to fans and do things yourself has just become a part of the tapestry of the industry yeah. and it is being adopted by the majors too. Um, Columbia is a great label. Uh, I think the iTunes pre-stream is a no-brainer for the reasons that have just been said. That's where their audience is. And yeah. of course, they want to maximize sales and exposure. My question, the interesting question was, did they consider a label and artist services company in the vein of, uh, let's say, Cobalt, for example? Because, yeah. you know, he said, look, Columbia have got a great team. They've got a worldwide network. So some of these label artist service companies do as well. But I think what Darren just said about budget and what you said is, is probably has probably been the deciding factor, the marketing yeah. budget um, and expertise behind that. So, yeah. Interesting. And uh, talking about uh, uh, D2C, actually, and, uh, and uh, crowdfunding, uh, uh, I, I might skip a couple of stories and just go down to Pledge Music, uh, as there were a couple of news from Pledge Music uh, in the last 10 days or so. First of all, Pledge Music announced hiring uh, Julian Huntley, who is uh, ex-Virgin Records, EMI, and UMG, as a global head of catalog for the company. And, uh, of course, most of the company's uh, uh, re- campaigns right now are... Uh, Uh, revolving around uh, new releases, uh, but uh, they had a string of successful projects for releases and box sets, including uh, BB King and Reef, and they showed that the catalog uh, part of it could, could be an important play and uh, it could be an area of expansion for Pledge. So expanding this part of the business seems like a logical idea and makes sense. Uh, you know, of course, you can budget better if you know how many copies you have to print of a re-release or if you know that there is a market for that particular re-release. Uh, so are you a fan of this approach to catalog and uh, are, are you hopeful that Perhaps this will bring about, uh, you know, reprints and, and cool editions of uh, perhaps niche uh, releases that uh, have a, a core audience that might buy, you know, three, four, five thousand, but wouldn't be able to be printed on, on a mainstream level. Uh, Kareem? Let's let's uh, let me shift this to Darren first. I'm still thinking. Yeah, if you're ready, sure, sir. of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I mean, I'm I'm in favor. Like, I, I mean, you know, I. I when that beat delete site came along that sort of crowdsources vinyl represses, it was one of those where I was just saying, how has this not happened before now? It's such a no brainer that yeah. it removes the, um, you know, the, the uh, risk element from running a repress that it's, it's a total no brainer. I mean, you know, so in that context of like catalog reissues and things like that, where, you know, it's just simply the question is, you know, prove that you'd all buy it before, we do it uh, is, is the big question, I guess, then, you know, I don't think that's a bad thing. And I think there's a lot of stuff out there where those kind of box sets come along and, you know, they could well be quite lucrative if, you know, you're selling to a, a, an established audience. You don't have to do a big load of marketing and TV ads to find the audience and connect them to the product. You know, so um, I think in that sense, you know, particularly at the moment and for the next you know, maybe 10, 15 years, well, there's a sort of certain generation of music buyer that, that are more towards a physical product and, dare I say, more like a sort of luxurious vinyl-led heavyweight pressing type angle, then um, then there probably is a very good reason to do this stuff. You know, I mean, Reef are a, a good case in point where there's a lot of people still love Reef and would quite happily put their money down for, for that kind of release, but it wouldn't be something where a major label would nece- necessarily rush in seeing a ton of money, but that's because in the economics of Sony Music or any of the other majors... Uh, you know, it, it, it's not going to turn over a huge amount of cash, but for a company like Pledge and for a band like Reef, it could be very lucrative. So um, why not? Yeah. So yeah. L- let me just catch up with the proposition then. So what they're suggesting is that they'll reissue um, uh, from their catalog, maybe make some nice new products out of it, box sets or what have you, and market that to their existing um, email base and fan base. Or are they working with the bands to re- reissue as well? Well, that, I think that's not campaign by campaign basis. I mean, uh, the, the new hire is uh, a pledge music hire, so it won't have anything to do with the majors. It's just a case of him coordinating projects that have to do with reissues and then... I guess leveraging on existing fan bases if they exist or finding ways yeah. to to reach them if they don't. Yeah, I I mean no, I agree then I think it's a good idea. I think there is demand for it. I'm a Reef fan so I'd be interested to hear from them. And if you look at some uh, some great uh, you know indie labels like Cherry Red for example, a lot of their um uh, their big releases are kind of re-releases in in lovely big box sets. Yeah. So um which look great, uh, feel great and and sound great as well. So yeah, there is a big market out there and it, it's all about creating this new sort of revenue for rights holders as well, not traditional releases but getting more out of kind of reissues yeah. and things like that. So, yeah, it's a good move, interesting move. And it happens that it happens at majors all the time as well. You know, majors have such a sprawling catalogs that there are often smaller independent labels that, knowing that Universal or Warner own a particular album, 
and knowing that they can sell, you know, two, three, four thousand copies uh, of that album and make a deal on the repertoire to be able to license it and uh, and remaster it and and produce those three four thousand copies and then they go rev- do, they do a revenue share with the major and the major itself would never be interested in doing that but if somebody comes along and decides to do it for them uh, and make the effort then why not yeah it's interesting and you know what the, but the challenge here is finding the fans again in some cases yeah. so let's take an example corduroy which was actually reissued by cherry red uh, i can't remember the album but the uh, high havoc right it's one of my favorite albums ever i didn't know about the reissue and as soon as i saw it i was uh, you know i said wow can i have a vinyl reissue please so if there is this crowdfunding or committing in advance to production element then people can take the risk or well there isn't any risk in that case so yeah. I think it's, but the challenge is spreading the the word about it. Yeah, finding the fans again. I must say, though, I'm quite surprised that the majors haven't tried to find a slightly more mechanized solution to this, probably more akin to the beat delete stuff, wherein, you know, people can simply vote to get something, you know, or, you know, pledge to get something uh, repressed or whatever, because you would think that logistically it probably wouldn't be that hard to put together if something had been released on vinyl before in terms of collecting together the assets and just doing a bog standard repress without the deluxe packaging treatment but i am quite surprised that the majors haven't done it when you consider that now between three companies they're sitting on an absolute you know shitload of, of stuff because yeah. let, you know let's not forget you know that, that many many indies that have come and gone got snapped up you know yeah. so you know, they own a lot of the, the former indies where they just bought out the brand and the company when it had gone into administration. So yeah. they own I mean, the it, it requires a bit of effort because I think, you know, every time something like that comes up, they do have to go back, find the original contracts, make sure that they have the rights to distribute the recording still and mm. how that works because not everything is, uh, you know, electronic yet, uh, unfortunately, especially for older releases. So mm. I think there's a little bit of effort into getting it off the ground rather than just being able to do it automatically from a tape that is part of the catalog just for a rights perspective mm. i think that's else. interesting and i think in many of the cases as well you know you're dealing with quirky situations so yeah. band members might hate each other <laughs> you know it might be hard to get that signature down on paper but it is a good question you know or, or maybe th- the way they produce or have deals with production companies is for much bigger runs of different sorts of products. I, I don't know. I'm interested yeah. to speculate think, more about this. I think you're both forgetting, though, that a record label, particularly the majors, they own the master recording. Mm. So they own the record. It's, yeah. not, it's not a rights question. They, the album is theirs. What, the, what they pay and those questions, yeah. And, and obviously there are contracts that state that you know, they're licensed for a certain period or you know, anything like that. But if you're talking like a physical reissue of something that's already come out, yeah, I don't think there's a huge amount of, uh, of you know, permissions needed because they own the master recording. So yeah. that product can be reissued as long as they they own the master recording. So I'm not sure. Maybe maybe it's you know it might be a, a little more complex than I'm thinking, but yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure it's that much more complex. No, I mean absolutely. If 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 the record is 100, percent it was released by the label in question, and they know that they own it and everything. That that's pretty straightforward. I guess I was thinking of more. Is, is exotic situations where there were a number of acquisitions made over the years and mm. perhaps you know there's not even certainty as to whether the original company owned the master or whether they, they just licensed it for release and then ended up in the archives or you know whatever it's, mm. it's, it's <laughs> it can be it can get pretty tricky when you're talking about recordings that are 30 or 40 years old and where there isn't a huge amount of uh, of of trails uh, on mm. them but uh, yeah. but yeah when we're talking about niche situation i think for the most part of what people would actually pledge to listen to it'll be pretty, pretty darn easy to find out. So this is an interesting for opportunity for Pledge then, going back to what they're offering. You know, they're already doing work with majors to build you know, white label versions of their platform in, as part of release campaigns. So they spy the catalog and go and do a deal with a major and then try and you know, find the rights themselves once they've proved demand or something like that. That's yeah. certainly an interesting opportunity then. Yeah, definitely. That's quite, it's quite cool. And uh, I wanted to talk about uh, new music. So uh, this weekend I was kind of uh, looking around trying to find out what, what, what new had come out on Spotify recently. And of course Spotify have taken away the, the big homepage uh, and replaced it with a Discover tab, at least on the client side. So you, you don't have a, a bird's eye view of the, the biggest releases that they've got uh, new out there uh, at the moment. And so I was trying to figure out, you know, what do you do? 
Uh, of course, the Dara, I know you use RDO for the most part. So I'm going to ask you uh, if you have any, any tips on that and if RDO organized things any better uh, on that front. Uh, I got a, t- a few tweets back uh, from tweeting out uh, asking uh, what people do. There are a few sites that uh, help on this front. Uh, there is a site called uh, uh, qusic.co.uk Q-U-S-I-C uh, which is interesting because it links up to Songkick and then it delivers you like a daily or weekly report of all the artists you track on Songkick telling you if there is a new release uh, that's come out by them which is quite cool uh, as, uh, you know of course people have pointed out Shuffler FM although there's a Shuffler does a bunch of other things uh, on top of you know also being able to find some new releases uh, on it there's a site called spotifynewmusic.co.uk which has been going for quite some time uh, and they let you search by genre country of release and week of release so you can look up you know every, all pop rock records released in the uk spotify uh, in the past uh, four weeks which is pretty neat uh, although there is no export function so you have to navigate side by side there's a site called the uh, Playlist, uh, playlist.net slash new releases, uh, which is actually sharing my playlist. It's been rebranded now to uh, playlists.net slash new uh, hyphen releases, uh, which has got a good list of, of, of stuff on there. Uh, I don't know. I just wanted to sort of share what I'd found and ask you guys if you have any other resources that you use to find new releases uh, on streaming services. Uh, uh, Darren, anything you're in? Um, I mean, on my side, uh, audio has got it pretty much down very nicely for me. I mean, it's a sort yeah. of threefold approach where, first of all, they put notifications when any new releases from artists already in my collection go up on the service. Um, and I also get an email from them summarizing that every week as well. So that's kind of cool. That's very cool. Then they have a front page of new releases that just shows you stuff that's out, you know, that um, I think has a degree of editorial to it yeah. um, and may be led a bit more by what's getting played most. Cause certainly mine tends to be skewed very pop and not, it's not the one I look at that most uh, that much. But the third bit that I use on there that I find to be probably the best way of, of sort of stumbling on stuff is actually that when, you know, I've sort of selectively added friends on RDO. So rather than sort of adding all my Facebook friends or whatever, I've selectively added people whose music tastes I like. And uh, there's a third bit of, of the sort of heavy rotation section in, in the RDO client that will show me what my friends are playing the most. Yeah. So if... You know, Sean from Drowned in Sound is caning the daughter album or whatever. You know, it will appear in there so that I can, you know, just see what everyone's listening to. And it puts a little icon at the bottom right uh, of, of each release so I can see who's been playing it a lot as well, yeah. which might be of use. I don't know if you want to contextualize it even more. So That's cool. um, I quite like that. I've been fiddling around with the Google um, All Access streaming service as well, yeah. though. And uh, that latches, if you're an Android user, that latches into Google now. Right. And um, is capable of telling you things like, you know, if, you, if you've searched on Google now for stuff about an artist, uh, it will tell you when a new release from that artist is available. And equally, I think it's the same principle as RDO, where it knows what's in your collection. So it's also right. capable of telling you when stuff's out by artists that you've already shown an interest in. So, um, you know, those, those are probably the, the two services that, you know, and how I'd interact with them. I have to say that I think the Discover thing on Spotify, maybe I'm not using it enough, but for me, it's just like dreadful. I you found know, a few just, things that worked for me that, you know, there were good recommendations, but it's, it's still not giving me what I want, which is sort of a bird's eye view. It's very messy, the layout of it. And so I can find the odd thing that I'm interested in, but it, mm. it's quite, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a feed of stuff and it's not organized in any chronological or otherwise discernible order. Uh, Kareem, anything, uh, Joran, that you... That you may, may recommend. Well, no, I've, yeah, I, I kind of like all of the points that you're both making. I think for me, I just boil this down. Uh, I still like word of mouth or right. social uh, recommendations. Full stop. I want a person to be behind it. So whether I'm looking yeah. at Twitter, whether I'm speaking to a colleague in the office, uh, or you know, looking at audio, seeing who's playing what, or looking at Spotify, like the stream on the right hand side in the client a lot. Um, I like to watch that go by. Um, that's still the strongest form of recommendation for me. I mean, if we're talking independent apps. I don't have necessarily or allocate a lot of time to discovering new music. And I think that's a problem all of these apps have, but um, is retaining people, you know, kind of retaining 
mind share and people looking at the app and 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 listening inside of the app yeah. but i do like shuffler fm um uh, a lot if, for curating the blogosphere if you like it's not somewhere i spend a whole load of yeah. my time so it's nice to get a picture of that that's really easy i really like the iphone app and discover is still really yeah. good uh, if you remember really that app um on the ipad it looks beautiful and it works very well so yeah. i don't need much more than that um i i've found um playlist.net great but i like people to recommend playlists i was asking kieran himself for some recommendations the other day so yeah. for me there does have to be that element of, of word of mouth or social you know someone i know vouching awesome. for it absolutely and uh finally last story of today we're going to talk about apple uh apple apple tv uh, so apple tv added the vivo application on it uh yesterday as far as i know uh so that's a really interesting move uh, uh, you know vivo uh is the first music focused uh streaming application even if it's video uh, that appears on the apple tv aside from uh apple's own itunes offering so that's uh, that's one interesting point uh, uh it's also the only addition to the uh, apple tv for this week uh, internationally because uh, of course the us got the weather channel disney xd and the smithsonian apps uh, but uh, uh the vivo one made it to the uk italy france poland the netherlands brazil ireland spain and new zealand so it's quite a quite a broad release so first of all you know what do you make of apple allowing a third party music streaming app to come into play uh, that's that's kind of an interesting move right yeah i think it's a very interesting move i need to think this one through some more um yeah. myself but i think <laughs> it's good um yeah comments on twitter to follow yeah, that's uh, right. yeah no very interesting i think it's just all a part of a of a content strategy that apple's trying to push through with apple tv and keep you know winning people over in the living room um I think, you know, obviously music video and music tracks are very different propositions. So they've gone to Vivo to supply some content here. Yeah. I want to look into what the form of the programming is. What's the news on that? I th I, is it all day kind of music video rotated? Is there an element of interactivity? On demand. It's all on demand. Yeah, it's all on demand. Well, then yeah. I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think it's a good thing to do. And I'm, I, I'm enjoying watching Vivo really spread itself around yeah. um, onto different platforms. And it looks uh, lovely. I mean, it's, it's you know, Apple it's a... TV easy to navigate it's very apple tv like you know they all look f fairly similar apple tv implementation so the, they must have a fairly strict internal sort of uh, uh, sdk to to develop these apps on apparently it was developed by vivo itself uh, apple didn't have much to do with it uh, and then it was released by apple and uh, and the other interesting thing darren is that there is no advertising uh, at the oh, wait, moment yeah this is the thing sorry to jump in darren. yeah sure the, the, the question for me then is who's getting what so what's exactly. the deal yeah. if there's no advertising it has is money changing hands you know what's going on there so that's, that's super interesting for me like I, i'm wondering if it's just a promotional factor because it's just launched and whether Ooh. ads are going to be implemented afterwards. But then again, the YouTube Apple TV app doesn't have advertising that I experienced myself. No, I, th I think now you mention it, I've not seen any ads on there. I mean, yeah. It's a funny one. I, th I mean, I think there's probably a degree of o over analysis because it's Apple's product. I mean, the reality is Vivo has been on an Xbox 360 for over a year, I yeah. think, if not longer, you know. And it's a really good app. You know, it works really well. It's kind of all woven in with connect as well so you don't even have to lift the remote to navigate through it and stuff it's does brilliant. it have ads as well uh yeah yeah so it runs ads and so does the youtube um app on there as yeah. i recall i mean actually don't, don't quote me on that i'm pretty sure they both run ads but yeah. um yeah you know and they're, they're they're uh you know they're both really good apps i just you know with apple tv i i, I mean i've got one i've got a second generation one which but i sort of jailbroke yeah, it and stuck uh, Xbox Media Center on it, and then it became useful. But prior to that, it was a bit of a damp squib, really. <laughs> Only because, I mean, you know, I own an Xbox 360 as well. Uh, <laughs> should boast, I got given one by Microsoft. <laughs> but, <laughs> nice. uh, it's, it's, the, it's the, yeah, it was, it was a free gift when I Freebie. did a Tiesto live stream with Xbox. You shouldn't have admitted ago. that. You should <laughs> not have admitted that. <laughs> a lot of people are going to be yeah. hitting you well, up. You know. yeah. yeah. So, anyway, but no, having got that, I mean, it, you know, having the two, you know, I think Xbox has done infinitely more to make their console like this kind of all encompassing, you know, living room device because it yeah. plays games. It's like the top flight gaming console. But it also has, you know, BBC iPlayer, YouTube, and all these things in HD. So, you know, it can do all that stuff in 1080p and everything, as long as your bandwidth can take it. So, really, kind of everyone sitting there talking about the Vivo being on the Apple TV is a bit, you know, I mean, I would imagine if you compared the sales figures for Xboxes to Apple TVs, you know, Xbox would far eclipse uh, the Apple product. So, 
Yeah. It's all good, but I, I mean, equally, I have to say, you know, I mean, as, as you two are probably aware, I bought that sort of this, this Android stick thing for my TV. Yeah. It's like a mini computer that cost me £30 and just plugs straight into an HDMI socket. It's, and, it, and it is, I mean, ostensibly, it's like a headless Android tablet. Yeah. You know, plugs into your TV. But using that, I can install damn near any Android app I want. So on that, I've got audio, Spotify, Google Music, you know, Vivo, YouTube. You know, I can put anything, well, pretty much anything from the Android world on it. And when you've got a device like that that costs a third of the price of an Apple TV, and you're sitting there realizing that you can literally do anything on it, you know, it's the same as a tablet, because the Apple market is, is as it is there, you know. It tends to make the Apple TV look kind of crappy when you look, you go from one to the other. I mean, yeah. the Apple TV is a much more simplified inter interface, and for you know, man in the street, it probably is the better device because it's it's kind of painless to use. But equally, sort of announcing that the Vivo app has landed on this is is weirdly a bit ridiculous when you consider that there's many technologies in our pockets that could quite easily pipe the video from. Yeah. You know, your phone to, to the TV, which is where Google's Chromecast thing is trying to stake its place and everything else. You know, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's, you know, the Apple TV could be quite easily sort of eclipsed out of the picture altogether with no great loss, you know, by just connecting up our handsets to tell you. I'm still this hoping it's going to... interesting one. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's cool. No, I was just going to say that I'm, I'm still hoping that it's going to get it opened up to developers uh, in, in Q3, in, in Q4, potentially. It needs to be, right? I, I, would, I, mean, love, I would love that to happen. It's got the potential as the you know the jail the jailbreak with the second one, you know, and, and the use of Xbox Media Center on it. You know, when you put Xbox Media Center on it, the Apple TV was awesome because yeah. then you could play absolutely anything, have plugins for you know whatever you care to name, really, really, really good. But equally, yeah. a rather damning statement about the Apple TV that it requires that in order to make it good. Yeah, sorry, Karim, uh, you were saying. It's all right. I was just highlighting this really kind of classic um, versus debate, you know, open ecosystem versus closed, love, you know, lovely consumer product and, and an ecosystem that people are locked into and used to with all of the syncing. So um, there is stuff out there that does stuff, but then there's Apple TV that we know and, you know, we plug in and it connects with everything and, and it works really simply. So I think a key thing would be opening it up to developers. Um, I think the Vivo uh, edition is sexy. That's why it's making some news. You know, it's giving you music on demand um, via Apple TV. So the most, the, the most interesting question to me is what's happening with payment and advertising, yeah. to bring it back to that, because I've been thinking about it while you, let, you chaps have been talking, and, you know, what's going on there? So are they saying to Vivo, right, you can't advertise, but we'll do a deal and feed iAds in somehow in the future? Or is it just straight kind of, you know, swapping some money over? I, I really want to know what's happening there. I I don't know how Apple, what Apple's stance is on having ex external adverts running on its own device in such an integrated app. Uh, yeah, is, there's a lot of question marks here. That uh, There's a cynical question that one has to ask, which is that maybe the deal has been done that says if you start driving more than X percent of traffic or you sell more than X number of devices such that you're presenting a significant load on our systems, then we exercise the right to run ads to monetize it. Because yeah. it may be, really. I mean... I haven't seen the sales figures of Apple TV, but I know they're not that integral to a, a, no. a gizmo to the living room. It's, you know, I think it was big, about 14 million overall. Yeah, you know, and when you compare like that. that to all the games consoles and what they can do and how they're being repositioned to be a sort of all-encompassing device. And, and equally, you know, you can't rule out the, you know, Sky particularly are doing some very interesting stuff where they're doing, you know, this sort of 10 pound, what's this, mm. like a rebanded Roku device, but it's, it's still a 10 pound Set top thing to, to you know use your web connection to bring TV and entertainment in, yeah. and likewise at the other end of it, they're doing very high end you know Wi-Fi connected boxes that you can set your stuff to record from your phone and and all of that. So in the midst of all that, I just I don't really think Apple TV is a particularly kind of you know people now sort of say to me, well, should I buy one? And my answer is always like, well, yeah, get a second generation one and then <laughs> jailbreak it and stick Xbox Media Center on it. But otherwise. No, I mean, these days, I'll probably, for my geekier friends, just tell them to buy one of those Android sticks because yeah. I'm still laughing at what a hilariously cheap purchase that was for yeah. something that can play anything under the sun in HD. So. Great. Well, uh, I wanted to finish by asking you guys about a couple of events uh, that, uh, that uh, you're going to. And so, first of all, Karim, uh, you're off to Bogota next week. So tell us all about uh, what, what you're going to do there and, and what, what's happening. 
I am indeed. I'm really excited. I've never been to Colombia or Bogota before. So uh, we put on, in partnership with local partners and the government uh, there, we put on a conference called Resonancia and have been doing so for, for over the last few years. And it's Resonancia 2013. It's, it's part of a bigger digital uh, media technology conference that's going on. And, and uh, usually um, our pool goes, but I've got the nod this time. So I'm, I'm really excited. I'll be doing a presentation. Awesome. Uh, I'm moderating an in, in conversation panel with Richard uh, I think Godahra is the right way to pronounce it, one of the founders of The Orchard, so I'm really looking forward to that yeah. and taking part in another panel. And it should be great. I'll tweet the lineup. I'll tweet the link afterwards, so if anyone's interested, they can have a look at the lineup. But certainly looking forward to that. That's very exciting. And uh, yeah, I, I, I told you to get in touch with Alejandro, who was on the show a couple yes, of months ago. Yeah. Uh, he's a... Uh, uh, like a radio presenter, I think, in Colombia. And uh, yeah, he does this kind of stuff. Is he so. definitely going to be there? I've, I've I don't know. I would, I would even imagine so because so. it's like he's got like a whole music industry blog there, uh, like a bunch of followers. And, and so I would have imagined that it would be something that he'd be interested in being at. I'm not sure if, he'd, if he was on his radar or not. But, uh, but yeah, interesting stuff. I, sh I should add one person I'm very much looking forward to seeing is uh, our old, um, my old colleague Juan Paz, who's oh, uh, excellent. one of the local partners. So it's going to be great to catch up with him. And he's he relocated over much there, yeah. Yes, he's now head of um, digital strategy for Sony in Latin America. Right. So he's he's done really well for himself, um, uh, as as deserved. And um, it'll be fun to 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 meet up with him again. And he's been driving this um, this this the music side of this yeah. tech conference. So. Awesome. Do you speak Spanish or? Not one bit. Not one bit. No. Okay, sign excellent. language, a little bit of Italian and sign language. I think. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And Darren, you you you've got uh, an event uh, as well that uh, you're quite excited about uh, in early October. It's called Hard Working Class Heroes. So what is that all about? Uh, yeah, so it's a it's a sort of three day event in Dublin that um, I first went to a couple of years ago. It's uh, it's basically a celebration of sort of you know it's a showcase for Irish you know bands. Um, yeah playing over the three days and there's some been, there's been some really good bands come through there that are now you know gone on to be pretty uh, successful but this year particularly they're introducing that they've always had a degree of a sort of you know artist panel type things where you know people are there and you know discussing various current issues as they affect bands you know um, and uh, this time they're sort of broadening that out to bring in much more of a tech element which is yeah. I think fitting, given there's you know there's a lot of tech people based in Dublin, really you know, so uh, it you know it, it seems right that they do that. But I think to be honest, more than anything, I just love it because it's very easy when you're in London to just get drunk on the music industry, like it's everything comes to you and all the bands are big and buzzy. And yeah. you know, I, I I love going out to other places, whether it's you know Newcastle or Dublin or. You know, I mean, I'm envious of Kareem going to, to Colombia because I think you go to those places and you immediately have the wake-up call that, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on that you never get to see yeah. and you never become aware of and you sort of think that the internet will deliver all this stuff to you, obviously. And of course, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't quite work like that. There's, there's too much din and people struggle to be heard over it. So I think it's, it's truly lovely when you go somewhere and reconnect with a, particularly a local scene, you know, and, yeah. and you see the local bands and they're all, you know, full of piss and vinegar and just really keen to, to show what they can do and everything else. And hard work and class heroes, I mean, is, is you know, you, you can always expect the Irish to put on a good event. A good, a good party, uh, yeah. And they, they never, ever let you down on that front. You know, they're supremely friendly. There's never a dull moment. They're a great bunch. The organizers are lovely. It's, it's just awesome from start to finish. And it's, right. I think it's now become my kind of favorite music event of the year just because I always leave and you know you've met great people you've you've had a great time but i think it's it reminds you why you do what you do and i think yeah. that is very welcome and should happen more often absolutely. and there's nothing like actually connecting with people in person is there, isn't no, there kind of, yeah. absolutely yeah. not you know and you meet you just meet people and it's you know it's it's lovely to to hook up with all these people that you, you know in my case i mean i remember going out and meeting um niall who is sort of nile and nine you know runs blog and he's a very influential music guy out there but over and above everything else he's just a top bloke <laughs> you know, so you meet him and go you know, out for obviously your statutory guinness you know and but he's he's a very sharp very clever guy That's phenomenal good. taste in music and you leave with a kind of note thing on your phone of about 20 bands that you should probably be checking out. So, <laughs> yeah, that's good. you know, and I, I love that. It, it, you just come home feeling really invigorated for being there. It's, it's brilliant. I, I can't recommend it enough. 
Awesome. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm going to embark on a bit of a whirlwind tour in <laughs> September yeah, as September well. Between are going to be a Berlin Music Week next uh, week, uh, then wow. Culture Tech uh, in Derry and the uh, Future Music Forum in Barcelona. Uh, and uh, where else am I going? Um, uh, somewhere else. Uh, I forgot. Bloody can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. And uh, uh, so, yeah, if you if you are at any of those events, uh, please get in touch. It'd be great to to meet up. And uh, thanks so much for joining me today, guys. It was uh, awesome having you uh, back on. And uh, thanks for taking the time. And thanks so much for listening. Pleasure. If you enjoy the show, I would love if you could pass it on to one person in your network today. That would be great. Uh, email your feedback on contact at digitalmusictrends dot com or leave a review on iTunes. Uh, thanks for listening. Have a great week. And until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.